everyone. My name is Madhya Tahir. I'm a Mellon Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands at ASU. Adrian Zakhar, um, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Madiha and I are moderators for today's event, hosted by Columbia University, where we both receive our PhDs. This event is part of a seminar series, Technologies of Power, where we host three speakers every other Friday throughout the fall. So today's event considers technologies of enclosure. As a concept, enclosure initially emerged uh, in relation to the privatization of land and the expansion of territorial control. Um, today, as our speakers will elaborate, the processes of enclosure have become high tech, enfolding the cell phone, the internet, and our digital worlds into technoracial surveillance assemblages. From Palestine to China to the US, the digital technologies technologies have become central to power and control. And the presentations today give us occasion to reflect on certain questions around digital enclosure. Specifically, we ask, how do digital technologies extend the colonial settler state of Israel, the penal col colony in China, and qualified racialized citizenship in the US? Um, second, in what ways do digital enclosures incorporate and expel gendered and racialized populations? And finally, what modes of political action are possible within the digital surveillance surround? You can find the full biographies of our speakers posted in the chat. I will shortly introduce them um, here briefly. Helga, our first speaker is Helga Tawil Suri. Helga is an associate professor in the Department of Media, Culture and Communication and the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at NYU. Helga's work deals with spatiality, technology, and politics in the modern Middle East, with a particular focus on contemporary life in Palestine, Israel. Our second speaker is Darren Byler. Darren is an assistant professor of international studies at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia, and a postdoctoral research fellow in the China Made Project at the Center for Asian Studies, CU Boulder. He's the author of a forthcoming ethnography titled Terror Capitalism, Uyghur Dispossession and Masculinity in a Chinese City, and a narrative-driven book titled In the Camp, China's High-Tech Panel Colony. And our last speaker is Charlton McElwain. Charlton is the author of the new book, Black Software, The Internet and Racial Justice, From the Afronet to Black Lives Matter. He's Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Engagement at, at New York University and Professor of Media, Culture and Communication at NYU. His, his work focuses uh, on the intersection of computing, technology, race, inequality, and racial justice activism. Thank you for joining us. So today we're experimenting uh, with, in our series, as we have been, uh, with how best to run an online forum. Um, so let me just explain to the, all of you joining us today how we're going to run today's event. Um, each of the speakers have pre-recorded a brief presentation. Um, so what we will do is we will run the first presentation and then we'll open the floor for roughly 10 minutes or so for audience questions. Um, and after um, each presentation has happened and after the final presentation, we will continue with a question Q&A for all of our speakers. So even if we don't get to your question initially, we will come back to it. Um, we hope to come back to it later on. Um, we encourage the panelists to engage each other's presentations. And we also encourage the audience to both ask questions and if you feel like it, post comments in the chat. Um, and what we hope for is an engaging conversation. So moving now to our first presentation um, is by Helga Tawil Suri. <laughs> So enclosure offers a way to analyze as in Israel-Palestine, which is what I'll be talking about today, uh, the intertwining of colonialism, of settler colonialism, of capital accumulation, regimes of surveillance, and technologies of control. But I think there's a few um, historical specificities and processes that are important to reiterate, which, which the term enclosure kind of immediately conjures up. One is that the British land movements and the acts of parliament and the early 1700s, to seize and transform land into private property is what we've historically kind of come to define as the land enclosure movement. And this enlargement and consolidation of land holdings, which were, you know, marked this really important transition from feudalism to capitalism. And as importantly, 
these overlapping forms of violence, of exploitation, of seizing assets and removal from the land, um, and the sort of general transformation into private lands were really core practices of colonialism and of settler colonialism more explicitly. And very often these transformations were endeavors that required changes <clears throat> in the law. And equally, they were achieved through various technologies, architectures, representational or visual devices such as maps, atlases, plans, walls, fences, hedges, uh, barriers, and all forms of other kinds of containment. So today, though, when we speak of enclosure, more often than not, we're referring to digital technologies, where private ownership, commercially driven or profit incentivized spaces have largely displaced publicly held ones. So access, infrastructure, vir infrastructure sorry, virtual spaces, as well as our means of interaction, transaction, communication and expression are enclosed. They're commodified, they're made for profit, they're surveyed. Some of this is very physical, as in the cables, the wires, uh, the hardware, the credit cards, the parking lot sensors, the smart rooms, the RFID-enabled passports, and all sorts of other examples. Some of this is also more ephemeral, such as in the control of the electromagnetic spectrum, broadcasting rights, cloud computing, uh, Wi-Fi networks, GPS mapping, and so on. And many of these mechanisms of enclosure um, also increasingly exist on the level of data and information, where specific individuals and more often companies own, operate, and claim ownership over the information and data and the new forms of value that are generated by us, the users. So things like the custom targeted ads that track our location, the clicks and the cookies that we create, uh, which or that we create, which then create valuable marketing data. Our search engine inquiries, our Gmail uh, inquiries, which help create powerful algorithms. Our TikTok scrolls, our Instagram and Facebook likes, our Amazon purchases, just about everything that we can imagine doing, the list is kind of endless. So I can kind of perhaps flip this around to say that certain logics, materialities, and technologies enter into the constitution of enclosure. So digital or high-tech enclosure nowadays tends to refer to the recentralization, consolidation, and subsequent commodification and control over the content that we create, that we share, that we upload, and also over our habits and behaviors that are then turned into valuable data, which are then mined, extracted, and sold. At the same time, uh, we're also kind of confronted with less and less physical and virtual spaces that are public and or free. So we have to pay, we have to subscribe, we have to log in, we have to accept ads, we have to accept surveillance, we have to basically fork over our data. Nowhere, arguably though, are these different forces and practices of enclosure as intertwined, as forceful, as exploitative, as alienating, and as profitable as they are in Israel-Palestine. And this is where we see various different forms of enclosure kind of come together at once colonial land expropriation, territorial dispossession, walls and checkpoints, smart weapons, security devices, drones, old and new forms of surveillance, digital controls, algorithms, the list goes on, and I will kind of uh, elaborate on this. Um, in terms of land enclosure, Israel continues to expropriate land, not simply public land or that which is cultivated by indigenous peoples, but even privately held uh, land by Palestinians. And this is often done through military force and the law, as we've witnessed, for example, this past summer in the expropriation of families across East Jerusalem. So Israel's colonial, Israel's colonial strategy uh, involves concentrating Palestinian populations into enclaves, confiscating land, demolishing houses, building settlements, building Jewish-only roads, even building Jewish-only cell phone towers. So in many ways, Israel comes to resemble, or not just comes to resemble, but is, in certain ways, a late 19th century model of a settler colonial state, where enclosure shows no signs of abating. So the West Bank and Gaza are divided and fragmented into these isolated enclaves. And inside each of these enclaves, most Palestinians are poor and working class. Their lives are marked by poverty, by dispossession, and by constant repression. The fragmentation and the containment of Palestinians takes place through these many visible and architectural aspects of enclosure. Maps, walls, checkpoints, turnstiles, fences, barbed wires, 
control towers, uh, bypass roads and highways, which are all then also compounded by control of movement, by permit systems and ID cards and much more. So suffice it to say that there's this kind of diffuse network across Palestinian spaces, which entrenches a sort of multi-layered enclosure program of territorial annexation, of economic degradation, of political disempowerment, and of social fragmentation. The role of the military and the security regime here is paramount. So Palestinian areas, and especially Gaza, have become zones of experimentation and control in which military technologies, policing, and security models and ideas are tried out and produced, so that the oppression of Palestinians is an intentional outcome as a source of profit. Is Israel relies on the confinement and the repression of Palestinians in sustaining its export-led economy. So at the political level, the Israeli state remains in control of the core military and political aspects, but at the same time, it contracts out and privatizes uh, the different kinds of services that end up controlling Palestinians. Um, at the economic level, this private securitization reaps tremendous profits. So in other words, the management of the conflict is one that stresses these technological solutions. Alongside the military and various security apparatuses, Israel also has a complex bureaucracy that perpetuates a surveillance enclosure. Gathering of information through both new and uh, like through low and high tech means, if you want, through informers, using information as blackmail, through military and police raids, arrests, quotidian uh, monitoring, even monitoring of animal movements and animal produce, control over exports and imports and cash flow, the list goes on. So surveillance is inscribed at the level of, that is in, inscribed at the level of Palestinian society is not just a tool for resolving a security dilemma, but it is a technique of social control, of political domination and of economic profit. Israel-Palestine is equally where digital enclosure kind of rears its ugly head. Internet and digital activity is extensively monitored and surveyed for Palestinians. Infrastructure is under full Israeli control. Every landline telephone call, for example, is physically wired through Israel. Cellular phone signals are under Israel's control. Palestinian internet providers' bandwidth and connection is also determined by Israel. And Palestinians are sold very little of it. So in terms of access, of infrastructure, and of space, it's not simply that these things have become private, but they're also limited, controlled, surveyed, and in the case of Palestinians, also cost a lot. So simultaneously, this condition of what I've elsewhere called digital occupation is formidably profitable for Israel. So it's no surprise to hear that Israeli firms are at the forefront of cybersecurity, of spyware, of digital censorship, of border, you know, border security control, cell phone tracking, and so much more. So a few examples, um, just to sort of uh, put, put this into context. Um, the Israeli uh, cyber, spy, cyber spy manufacturer NSO is among the largest high-tech companies operating in the, sort of, in the world of espionage and state spying. Pegasus software, or spyware, is designed to penetrate mobile phones, and it's sold to countries ranging from Mexico to Myanmar, Saudi Arabia, but also European countries who then use Pegasus to, uh, to sort of ascertain whether or not asylum seekers really did originate from Afghanistan or Eritrea or Syria by sort of tapping into their cell phone data. Israeli firm Black Cube worked for Harvey Weinstein to dig up information on his Hollywood accusers. Uh, the security firm G4S is a sort of well entrenched, is, is well entrenched in the US profit driven mass incarceration system. The thousands of video cameras that are installed throughout the New York City subway system and the ability to automatically sift through all of this video uh, data. Uh, are those by the Israeli firm Visual Defense. A de another firm called Suspect Detec Detection System uh, is a firm that uses biometric information such as how, a per how much a person sweats and how uh, to determine a level of threat. You can spot, for example, the scanner of the anti-theft Israeli company Checkpoint in just about every shop or mall in the United States, a technology which 
shouldn't come as a surprise, was really kind of emerged uh, at checkpoints in the West Bank. Any Vision, another Israeli biometric company, specializes in AI or artificial intelligence, as well as face, body, and object recognition, and, uh, mon- and consistently sort of monitors checkpoints in the West Bank, and then cross-checks Palestinians by linking not just what happens at the checkpoints, but also various cameras that are installed throughout the Palestinian territories, and then accessing these different captured images. So Israeli firms are at the forefront of the convergence between, you know, predictive policing and computer algorithms, right? So algorithms are themselves then trained to learn, to codify, to manipulate and make visible Palestinian behavior, as well as the tendencies, uh, as well as, as people's tendencies, with the aim of sort of transforming these into strategies of control. Um, all of this, you know... Um, Israeli firms mine social media data. That shouldn't sort of come as a surprise either. And then this kind of data is then stored and in many cases used to extort or blackmail a person. The Palestinian Authority now also uses predictive policing uh, for arresting Palestinian dissenters by evaluating the contents of social media participation and posts, even on people who don't have any, uh, who haven't committed any violent acts or haven't even engaged in protest activities. So the examples are plenty, and while mo- I think all of the ones that I've pointed out are kind of largely malicious, uh, the point here is really to recognize the connection between territorial, economic, and digital enclosure of Palestinians, the commodification of the data that they create, and very often unwillingly, sometimes even unknowingly, the lack of transparency and public oversight, and then the profit that these enable to Israeli and other firms and governments. And the point, or not the point, but part of it is also to recognize that it doesn't matter to what ends. Yes, sometimes it could be about threatening democratic norms or strengthening strengthening the grips of dictators or or, uh, sort of colonial or authoritarian rules, but it's also about monitoring the workforce or your competitors or citizens or just enriching corporate officers and stockholders. Um, So Israel's use of all of these technologies and tactics have to be understood in this broader context of exerting control through systems that result from the dynamics of enclosure. So enclosure refers to these le- to legal and symbolic power, to a form of social alienation, to a mode of existence where economic precarity is actually exacerbated. It's a means by which we can understand capitalist spaces. It's also uh, it's also these spaces, if you want, where people's political organization or socioeconomic freedom is undermined, where people face restrictions on physical mobility on freedom of expression, where the circulation of political thought is constrained. Um, It also gestures towards this regime of imprisonment, of warfare and state violence, of the intertwining of technological controls and geopolitics. So while this is critically important to understand the Palestinian predicament, it's also becoming a landscape that is possible and increasingly not just possible, but actually in existence everywhere. Israel is a high-tech settler colony located at the front lines of this global war on terror. But Israel is just a node, if you want, in the larger network. The designs and the techniques emerge in one site, proliferate in another. Coordination, cooperation, trade, sales take place globally with little regard to public good, to equality or justice or democratic ideals or ethics beyond the bottom line. So enclosure is the overlapping of colonialism, of capitalism, and of surveillance technologies. In the case of Israel-Palestine, it signals ominously for any future peace between them. But I think it's also a lot more pernicious than that, because it's, it's increasingly the digital and the real world in which we all live, no matter where we are. Thank you so much, Helga, for that wonderful talk. Um, I'll start with asking a question. So the picture you paint here is frighteningly true. Hashtags, online social media presence, and our virtual personas are all tracked. But to what extent is this surveillance accurate? Since the protest of Sheikh Jarrah, 
Several uh, Instagram accounts uh, were shut down, but they quickly returned after mass mobilization by some, um, you know, by some to return these accounts. Additionally, some of the posts covering Israeli occupation forces eviction of Palestinians managed to evade um, Instagram's algorithms of censorship by fooling them, either by mixing, you know, English script with Arabic, um, a script removing or playing with the punctuation to break up hashtags, uh, or to find new ways to con continuously change these hashtags and creating uh, backup accounts. So our first question is, is, is the story of the demise of the internet as the last comment that real? Um, or is it entering a new chapter? And what is accuracy? And what is the relationship of surveillance to the real? Um, has the reality constructed by surveillance tools taken over? Um, and what questions does this all raise for, uh, with regards to accountability? Those are great questions, Adrian. Thank you. Um, well, can I just quickly say thanks for having me here? It's a pleasure to be here, although always strange to watch yourself on video. But anyways, um, I guess maybe my first response is first, I, you know, I always feel like I'm such the downer pessimist. It, the world is horrible. You know, I, I mean, I, I just listened to this talk. It's like, wow, it's, it's pretty bad. And there's, there's a part of me that, that, that is right. I guess the way that I'm going to answer your question, though, is that I tend to often, um, or I have often sort of entered the, the conversation from the question of the material or the question of the political economic, right? So when I think about what is built where, who, is, who owns that? Who's making money off of those things, right? That, that sort of material, the, the matter, both like financial matter, but then also these sort of like technological matters, right? So if I look at those, I feel like, no, it is a pretty sort of pernicious, precarious, uh, dom you know, kind of dominating world in which um, in the case of Palestinian dispossession, dispossession kind of continues, right? So that's one way for me to answer your question and then sort of flip it to be like, oh, but what you're also asking me about then is content, right? So what happens in the realm of content, which I suppose like analytically, I sometimes see as different, right? So there's the question of who's, who owns the network, the stuff that makes money, the, you know, the algorithms, the ads and so on. And then what actually happens on the level of sort of everyday communication and content. I think to me, it's like, you've hit the, I don't know what the number is, the $36 million question, right? Like, well, what is the relationship between whatever base and superstructure content and materiality? Mm -hmm. um, it's, so it's kind of like getting at that. And I don't know if I have an answer for you, except to sort of think of it analytically or as a kind of intellectual question of where does one focus, where does one's focus lie and how do you kind of go about answering that? So it's, so it's not to say that I don't recognize that there are spaces of possibilities. I just don't necessarily look in that realm. At, I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't feel like I look in, on that realm, right? I, I'm sort of buried underground and in the towers and electromagnetic spectrum and stuff. Um, I feel like you asked me a second question about the kind of relationship between, I feel like you also, you, you maybe have to repeat it for me, but I felt like it was a sort of question about, well, what is accurate and what is real and how do we know? And, um, I, and I don't know if, if, it's, if it's a question of like, how do we think about resistance, if you wanna call it that, in the virtual realm, right? So mm -hmm. on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, through movies, mm -hmm. uh, whatever. And mm -hmm. um, how does that then translate or not into effects on the ground? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That's how I understood your question. I don't know if that's what. Um, I don't know if that's what you meant. Um, it's. I, I think it's important to to obviously state that no system of enclosure, no system of uh, no system of colonialism, no system of dispossession, none of those things can exist sort of 100% kind of lockstep and barrel together, right? It's, of course, it's a kind of constant uh, negotiation between what is happening between those who are being um, surveyed, 
for example, and those who are doing the surveillance, right? There's always sort of, uh, I don't know, wormholes, there's always loopholes, there's always tunnels, right? I mean, Gaza, it's, that's sort of what people often think, right? So there's obviously kind of ways to sort of move around these different things. I, I guess for me, it's, it's often the question of, all right, well, how do we then translate that into politics or policies on the ground? Um, and this is perhaps where my pessimism tends to sort of come back because I don't often see the results on the ground. If I look historically at what the state of Israel has been doing to Palestinians, uh, it's progressively worse. So sure, you know, there's been tweets and there's been Instagrams about Sheikh Jarrah and, and so on, right? At the end of the day, though, it's like, well, you know, the settlements of Mali Adumim are going to expand. The, the highways are going to expand. Uh, you know, if one family maybe doesn't get kicked out of its uh, of its home in Jerusalem, you know, two others will. So, I, so to me, overall, it's it's it. I still kind of end with this uh, sort of very, um, yeah, disheartening kind of image. Thank you for that, Helga. We have a, an audience question actually, and I have my my own question, but I'll ask you that afterwards. So the question from the audience is, can you talk a bit about how there might be direct corporate ties of surveillance tech firms, i.e. biometrics, data, facial recognition, with the US to augment the prison industrial complex and policing of black and indigenous folks in the US? And I think I'll, I'll just add to that a little bit. I'm wondering whether you think that surveillance capitalism really takes on a life of its own or whether it's still largely directed by the needs of, you know, it, it, empires and colonial settler yeah. policies like what's what's leading what in some ways yeah I mean I guess maybe I'll just start with that which is I, I think it's important to sort of see the continuities and the entrenchments of things right so even with something you know I, I think about we're going to look at internet surveillance for me you can't look at internet surveillance without looking at uh, well, where are the Wi-Fi towers and, and where do those exist? And if you sort of keep, un, if you keep sort of, I don't know, un, unlayering, if you want, mm -hmm. the maps, you'll discover, oh, well, of course, is where the telegraphs were set up in the 1900s by the Brits, right? So it's, so to me, it's not separate, but it usually sort of, you know, it's, it often kind of builds on, on, on top of each other, right? These sort of these layers, so these entrenchments, if you will. Um, so that's kind of uh, one, one, one part of the answer. The other is, I feel like I, I'd have to, um, I have to dig up the specifics to answer that question of like which firms and, and who are they dealing? And, you know, uh, there's, there's all kinds of things. It's like the firms that make turnstiles, the firms that make, uh, you know, I don't know, like weight controls of like, you know, prisoners who are kind of going in and out of jail just to sort of see how much they weigh and, and, and how much they sweat and all, all these kinds of things. There's also, um, you know, things like uh, different sort of the, the practices, not just only the technologies, right, but the sort of practices of police tactical control, maybe that's sort of what they're called, but ultimately they're also very military, right? So you look at something like Ferguson and you can't help but sort of see the parallels between how the populations of Ferguson are being controlled and how a population, like, I don't know, at a checkpoint is being controlled. Um, so the, the, the connections are many. I think there's a lot of uh, different um, whatever it's shareholders or board of directors, there's a lot of subsidiary firms. So on a sort of, on a purely financial level, there are a lot of connections and I, I'm, I'd have to sort of go back and look at the, the specific details to be able to answer that. So um, another question that I had, and this is something I've been thinking about as well is, you know, you mentioned the experimentation um, on Palestinian life and on Palestinian communities. And I'm thinking about, you know, how do you conceptualize the use of Palestinian lives as experimental fodder for Israeli spy uh, companies? And the reason I'm thinking about that is because a lot of work in technology studies tends to think about um, immaterial labor, right? So like we, we like something on Facebook and there's a kind of voluntary labor that we engage in for these organizations. Um, for their profit. But in the context of occupation, there's something very different happening. There's, there's nothing very voluntary about it. Um, and sort of the digital capture and experimentation on Palestinian lives and communities, but you know, this is 
useful, I think, in other spaces as well. It's something qualitatively different uh, than labor, I think. So what kind of frameworks can one use to think about the colonized Palestinian subject under conditions of digital enclosure? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I think that it used to be labor, right? Up until a certain point, up until, I don't know, the 1990s or sort of mid nineties, right? Where a lot of the kind of cheap exploited uh, surplus labor within Israel was Palestinian, was coming from places like Gaza and the West Bank. There's a little bit of that still, not in anywhere near the same numbers as it used to be uh, 20 years ago. So it is this sort of move. And this is this, this to me is interesting to think about on that kind of larger global scale, right? So as we move into whatever you want to call them, kind of technological worlds and knowledge economies and so on, um, what happens to that surplus labor that is perhaps no longer as necessary as it used to be, right? Mm -hmm. So it becomes this surplus population, right? Of like, what are we going to do with these people? We're going to lock them up in the case of Gaza and just, you know, somehow I'm at hope nobody's going to pay attention, right? Um, so I think there's this really interesting shift that does happen away from that kind of physical uh, or, or those sorts of ideas of labor to, to uh, a kind of more, uh, what's the word? Not abdicated, but uh, abjected sort of life, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's one way. The other is that no matter what, what's fascinating I think about media, technology, all of that is that even when we know it, even when we know that we might be tracked, even when we know that it, it might kind of, I don't know, profit Jeff Bezos or something, right? We still partake in it. And, and I think part of that is that there is something that is appealing. There is something that is being offered to us. There is something that, whether it's entertainment, whether it's connection, whether it's, you know, I'm trying to communicate with somebody else. Um, so that's also a different kind of, it's a not enclosure in the same way, but it's a different sort of containment of, of our realm of possibilities, right? And in that sense, I mean, Palestinians are no different than anybody else. Of course, they want to play games. Of course, they want to watch squid games. That was called. I stayed up to three o'clock in the morning watching this yesterday. Um, so, you know, of course, people want to participate in these different kinds of things. And, and on that level, I don't think it helps to sort of think of Palestinians or anybody else as somehow exceptional because they're under different sorts of political duress, right? They're also human beings who need to communicate and chat and charge their batteries and do all sorts of things, right? So I guess it's sort of I'm not really answering it, but. No, no, that's really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see you saying as, you know, they're, they're also involved in this, these forms of labor, but then they're, it's layered on to, other things are layered onto this as well. Yeah. Um, I guess the only thing is that there is, there's very little opting out, right, as a Palestinian. But I don't know, maybe you can sort of make that claim of as a US citizen, sitting in New York City, there's also very little opting out that I could do, right? Like, uh, I mean, here I am on Zoom. I don't know, I, I, you know, I, I pay Verizon or AT&T or whatever it is for, for my different access. You know, I have an iPhone, uh, you know, so unless you're gonna completely extricate yourself from uh, the world that we live in, we're all participating in certain ways um, unwillingly. Yes. And unknowingly. Yes. I agree. <laughs> um, so we have a number of really wonderful questions and we will return to these questions. So please um, keep, keep, keep posting them. Um, for the moment, we're now gonna move on to um, Darren Byler and his presentation. So let me just pull Thank up you. the screen. Thank you. <clears throat> My talk today is focused on material and digital enclosures in Northwest China. In order to understand what's happening to the Uyghurs, which is a Turkic Muslim group that lives in Northwest China that calls it their ancestral homeland, we have to go back to the 1990s, which is when China was becoming a manufacturer for the world, 
um, and was needing raw materials to drive their economy. And one of the sources of those raw materials was in northwest China, a massive space the size of Alaska, um, where the Uyghurs are from, as well as other Turkic and, and, and uh, other uh, native groups. When the, we, when the migrants arrived in that space and began to build out the infrastructure to get at the natural resources that were located there, they first built the hard infrastructure, the pipelines, the railways, uh, all of the things that were necessary to get access to oil and natural gas, which you know, around 20% of Chinese oil and natural gas is, is from this region. Over time, they built up a service sector that supported the resource extraction economy, and then they began to build out industrial-scale agriculture. And so by uh, as recently as last year, this region now produces around 85% of Chinese cotton, um, as well as around a quarter of the world's tomatoes. Now, the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs, who are the, the two largest groups in this region, together around 13.5 million people, were largely excluded from that new economy. Instead, they were pushed into kinds of tenant farming um, in, in the agricultural sector. And they also saw the cost of living begin to rise. This made Uyghurs increasingly desperate um, to find a way forward into the, the new economy. Um, they were excluded from the, the, the more lucrative sectors of the economy due to discrimination, which was systematic throughout the region. Uh, job ads simply said, no Uyghurs need apply. In 2010, a new element was built into this system, an element that um, began to move from a sort of material enclosure of space, all of that infrastructure that was being built, the hard infrastructure, to a kind of softer infrastructure, a digital enclosure um, that was facilitated by 3G networks. So when I began my first year of fieldwork in the region in 2011, I was meeting all of these young Uyghur men uh, in regional centers who, who were buying smartphones for the first time and were learning how to use a new app called WeChat, which is a social media app that was authorized by the Chinese state. Um, it's owned by a company called Tencent and allows people to send uh, voice messages to each other. Uh, this was a game changer for Uyghurs. Prior to this, Uyghurs had to use um, either Chinese or kind of invent an alphabet uh, using Latin script that uh, would allow them to communicate in their own language. Now they could simply speak into device and send messages to each other. The other thing that the oral messages did is it allowed Uyghurs to circumvent much of the surveillance systems, the censorship systems that are in place in China. In, as I was conducting my field work, I was seeing lots of young men using their smartphones to organize um, in communities in migrant enclaves in urban areas. Uh, they were looking for jobs, um, and they were also looking for more freedom. When I began my second year of field work in 2014 and 15, I met lots of young men who were going to the mosque in the city um, and were organizing themselves in these mosque communities mostly using WeChat. They talked about the mosque space as a space uh, where there was a, a kind of censorship system in place that prevented them from fully embracing what they called real Islam. But they said that on, online, on their smartphones, they could talk about real Islam, the Islam that they were learning about from people in diaspora, from people in Turkey and Egypt, and also among themselves. Um, they didn't realize at the time that they were leaving a digital footprint. By May 2014, uh, the state um, had become quite concerned about the kind of efflorescence of Uyghur culture and Uyghur religious practice that was facilitated by the internet. Um, and so as they declared the people's war on terror in response to several violent incidents, one of which was that was described as, as China's 9-11, they began to target religious practice itself. And so in the neighborhoods where I was living at the time, um, I began to see these posters erected everywhere uh, that said it's no longer permitted for women to veil themselves, for men to have beards, or to have Islamic symbols on their clothing. Within the space of three or four years, the state began to enact a, a quite um, 
dense digital enclosure that began to capture um, digital traffic that was coming out of the Uyghur community. It was a, an alliance between state security and private industry and was supported by the hiring of over 90,000 new police officers. The initial goal of this system was to break the autonomy of the Uyghur internet, but over time it became more of, of an actual m uh, control system, one that prevented people from moving and from speaking uh, freely in, in any form at all. There's now 1,400 tech firms that are working in this space. Um, some of the, the tools that they've developed are tools to automate the transcription, translation, and assessment of Uyghur speech. Um, this is a, a tool that allows the, the voice memo system that was being used on WeChat to be assessed by the state uh, and, and these private companies. The other thing that's being built by a number of different companies is automated detection of Uyghur and Kazakh faces using surveillance video. Um, so these are real-time detection systems that will simply read the phenotypes of a person's face, the shapes of their eyes and nose, in order to detect whether or not they are Uyghur or Kazakh. Um, and if the person is on a watch list, the police will be alerted uh, to their presence. By 2017, the state had uh, dispersed uh, a new set of tools called uh, counterterrorism swords, um, which are a kind of digital forensics tool that can be plugged into someone's phone and can assess their digital history. Um, it scans through the person's device um, in a matter of minutes and looks for markers of religious or political activity. Um, the number of markers that are looked for range between 50,000 and, and 75,000 uh, different markers. And of course, um, the, the list grows over time as more and more phones uh, and devices are assessed. Uh, in my interviews with police officers who did some of these scans, um, they said that they would receive readings on the counterterrorism sword that alerted them to the fact that the person they were, the, whose phone they were scanning had been going to the mosque regularly, had worn a hijab, or had pictures of people wearing hijabs, had a beard, had contact with people in Muslim-majority countries, had listened to unauthorized religious teachings, had become a member of a religious study group on WeChat, had studied Arabic or Turkish, or had just simply used a VPN, a virtual private network, to circumvent the censorship system in China, something that's quite common uh, throughout China, um, or had used WhatsApp on their phone. Those that were assessed as untrustworthy through these scans were then sent to a new system of camps, a kind of re-education camp system um, that the state has described as vocational education and training centers. Now, when we look at the government bid contracts for these, these camps, we can see quite clearly that these are not schools in a normative sense, uh, that these are smart camps, that's how they're often described, that use um, surveillance systems throughout them that have a razor wire at the perimeter, the guards carry non-lethal weapons, um, and the detainees are held in locked cells. It's really more of a medium security prison that has an educational component to it, often through distance learning that is on the screens that are up on the walls in the cells, and also in fortified classrooms. In mid-2018, we began to see detainees being transferred from um, camps to other spaces. And we also began to notice documents from the government that talked about the way the camps were becoming a carrier of the economy. Um, they began to talk about how um, the human labor that was coming out of the camps was another additional resource like oil and natural gas that could drive the, the, the economy in that, in that part of China. Now, most of these factories are centered on uh, cotton production um, or textile production that's connected to, to cotton production, um, which makes a lot of sense. As I mentioned already, 85% of Chinese cotton comes from this region. Um, and already jobs are leaving China to go to places like Vietnam or Bangladesh because in eastern China, the cost of labor is rising. Now there's this new subject population coming out of these camps, held in place by these camps, and the surveillance system that can be put to work. One of the women I interviewed in 2020 uh, in Kazakhstan, where I, I, I conducted interviews with around 40 people that had come across the border recently, 
Um, one of them was this woman, Gulzira Al Khan, who was found guilty of watching Turkish TV shows and of, flying, of traveling to Kazakhstan, of having a passport, of being under the age of 55, all markers of her potential untrustworthiness, and had spent about a year in a camp um, and then was released for several days and then sent to work in a factory that was seven kilometers from the camp she had been held previous. When she arrived in the factory, she recognized her boss, this man, his name is Wang Xinghua, who had come to the camp several times, had stuck his head in her cell and, and had selected her to be a worker in his factory. Here he's speaking in a state-sponsored interview, talking about how the factory is creating 2,000 jobs for Kazakhs and Uyghurs um, and is generating $6 million in sales uh, in 2019 or 2018. What he doesn't mention in his interview is that he was paying Gulzira and the other workers only around 300 yuan, which was around $50 um, uh, per month, um, and on top of that, a penny and a half per pair of gloves that they made. This is you know, less than a sixth of the minimum wage in the region. Um, and so Gulzura said, you can see from this that it was a kind of slavery. He's also not mentioning that the surveillance system suffused this factory space, that there's checkpoints that workers go through as they enter where they have their ID scanned, where their bodies are checked for, for any, any sort of um, tool that they might be taking from the factory space. He's not mentioning that Gozira and the others were held in a dormitory at night uh, where they were watched by state workers, um, that their phones were checked several times a day, um, that uh, if they tried to leave the factory or dormitory uh, and go through one of those checkpoints, an alarm would sound and the police would be summoned. Um, so Gozira said, you can see from this that the entire region is a kind of open air prison, that even if you're not inside the camp, you are still within an enclosure. So what does all of this mean? Well, in some sense, what's happening to the Uyghurs is part of capitalist frontier making or the building of the market economy more general, generally. M material enclosure is central to the original accumulation of capital in market economies. Uh, this is something that Karl Marx referred to as primitive accumulation. In order to, to begin this process, the land that's held in common needs to be monetized and turns in, turned into commodities. Um, the way that this is enacted in many cases is through a legal regime of property ownership, through wage labor, um, and the capture of social relationships and behavior. Um, in this case, in the Uyghur case, it's the global war on terror um, and, a, and a legal apparatus around that that's being used to justify the detention of, of Uyghurs and Kazakhs. Now, it's important to understand that capitalist frontier making is, is a feature not a bug, of, of all of market economies. We're always in a race to the bottom. Digital enclosure, um, which are systems that begin to capture social relations in the mind in order to extend the logic of the factory and workhouse, um, are something that are being used throughout uh, contemporary capitalist systems. Um, in, in the West, most of these systems, particularly when it's, it's targeting protected citizens, um, are often focused more on the consumption and, and, and making consumption practices more efficient, uh, in increasing advertising, making it more precise. But it also has a carceral aspect to it as well, particularly when it's pointed towards vulnerable populations. Now, in the United States, for instance, this often has the effect of pushing undocumented people, black and brown people, into um, a, a gray economy on the margins of society um, into forms of labor that are slightly at the, at the, the side of the surveillance systems. In the Uyghur region, something different is happening. Uh, they're not only being banished to prisons, um, but they're not being allowed to, to leave. They're not being forced into forms of deportation or, or into ghettos. Instead, they're being pushed into factory work. The private public tech that's building the matrix of assessment control and removal in these systems um, is being used to hold the targeted population in place and put them to work as a class of unfree workers in the re-education labor regime. 
For now, the system requires an army of unfree data police checkpoints and camps in order to be operationalized, which means that the system that's targeting the Uyghurs is going to be difficult to replicate in other places. It will take a great deal of economic and political will to, to put it in motion. But that's not to say that these systems don't travel in some ways, uh, because we see similar technologies being used at the southern border of the United States um, and in places like Palestine and Kashmir, uh, all at the same time, um, just to slightly different effects. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to a great discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Darren, for that wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. Um, you know, your, your, your talk really reminds uh, you know, we were talking about it. There's so many kind of resonances um, between the kind of situation that you describe uh, on the one hand with Palestine, uh, you know, Gaza is often referred to as an open air prison um, mm -hmm. and then also the US in terms of cotton and slavery and also um, uh, the war on terror. So I think one of the first kind of questions that I wanted to ask you is, you know, there's a way China and U.S. tend to be pitted against each other and, and seen as kind of oppositional, um, as if they have two very different ideologies and frameworks. But what you're showing us here, you know, you're talking about the people's war and terror, China's 9-11, uh, is that there are at least discursive continuities between the U.S. and China. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the people's war and terror and kind of how does it or doesn't it relate to U.S. discourses on the war and terror? Um, and what are the kinds of links and resonances across these spaces? Uh, well, great question. It's an honor to be here. Um, so the discourse of terrorism really enters China you know, one month after September 11, 2001, um, which is when they started to talk about Uyghurs as terrorists. Prior to that, they had talked about Uyghurs as separatists, as wanting to have their own state. Um, and they talk about Tibetans in the same way. Um, but very quickly after September 11th, they, sh they, they shifted labels to terrorists um, and, you know, use that to describe sort of local incidents of protest over land seizures and things like that. Um, fast forward to 2010s, uh, that's when you know, we actually started to see some incidents of violence carried out by Uyghurs that attacked Han civilians, which was new. Um, before it was mostly, you know, targeting the state um, if there was violence. And that's really when the state really thought that they need to develop a, you know, a counter-terror strategy, you know, at a beyond the discourse discursive level. And so after this massive incident in Kunming, it's a city in southwest China where um, over 30 Han civilians were killed by, by Uyghurs, um, the state you know, this happened in front of everyone's cell phones. And so it was impossible for the state to control the narrative. Um, and so they said, okay, we're gonna own this and say it's China's 9-11. Um, and that's when they started to get um, security tech involved um, with the largest tech firms in China, um, Alibaba and Baidu and iFly Tech, which is a voice recognition company. Um, and they said, you know, we've been looking at the Snowden revelations, which had just come out the year before, and we can see that US tech is helping the US in, in counterterrorism, and we should be doing the same. Um, and so that's really when tech, you know, starts to get all this state funding to build these tools to assess the Uyghurs and to really lead the information, informationalization of, of the people's war on terror. Um, and it also feeds into strategy and tactics. Um, so you can see in the policing literature that they're looking at looking to Israel for best practices and how to do counterterrorism. They're looking to Chechnya, they're looking to the United States um, to think about counterinsurgency theory, like they're reading the Petraeus Doctrine. Um, and then they also are, are reading CVE theory, uh, countering violent extremism, which is you know, domestic uh, preventative policing where you're supposed to stop people from being radicalized. Um, and, you know, they say that we're going to do those things, but do them with Chinese characteristics, which is, you know, something that they often say about how they're doing things, um, which just means that they're going to do them at, at a much larger scale. Um, and they're going to sort of change the laws to make them match what they want to do. 
Um, and so they introduced counterterrorism laws that outlaw things that in the past were legal or at least sort of quasi-legal, which is like fasting during Ramadan, going to the mosque. Um, you know, even like WhatsApp is sort of illegal, but not really. But now it's it's it is fully illegal as a as a terrorism crime that's not serious or as a pre-crime. Um, and that's you know when they started to use the tech to begin to assess the population, it was those laws that they used to decide who should be sent to the camps as a sort of minor pre-criminal, someone who was prone towards terrorism. And you know they did that at the level of population. So it meant that it was a massive operation that you know, targeted hundreds of thousands of people. Um, thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Darren. That's really fascinating. And uh, we had a, a few more questions. One of them is about the title of your book, Terror Capitalism. Um, now that's a very evocative phrase, but can you tell us a little bit more about what it means and how it relates to digital enclosure? And, and is it related to what Shoshana Zuboff has called surveillance capitalism? Um, and then another set of question was about your abolition work. So you're part of an abolitionist group called World Without Prisons. Um, and so how do you find, um, how do you find uh, abolitionist thought uh, helpful in conceptualizing the situation in China? And does it make headway among Chinese and Uyghur activists? Um, and, and what are their framework for thinking about how to resist the penal colony uh, and surveillance uh, state in China? Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, great questions. Um, okay, so what is terror capitalism? Um, well, so it was me trying to understand what was happening uh, in this space and not simply reduce it to state power and to you know, an authoritarian state, which China is. Um, but it's also linked with the global economy. So, you know, I was interested, I think, in thinking through Shoshana Zuboff's framework, surveillance capitalism, which is really about consumption and, you know, middle-class white people <laughs> in North America, I think, um, to, to thinking about, you know, what does this look like in other spaces and when it's pointed at vulnerable people? And also, like, how is the category of the terrorist produced, you know, through technology, through algorithms? Um, what happens when there's 75,000 markers of terrorist or pre-terrorist or non-serious terrorism crimes that can be used to assess your digital history over the past you know, five years? Um, and so, so, so there, there's, they're producing a, a certain category of people that are detainable. Um, and in the Chinese context, it means that they can then be put to work as low wage or unfree workers um, who can be paid very little or not at all. Um, and so it's, it's producing this new class of workers, um, which is where that penal colony sort of um, framing comes from. So terror capitalism itself is a frontier of global capitalism. And I see it, you know, here supporting that penal colony that it's an internal settler colony of China. But I see, you know, that sort of framing happening in many places. Um, I think it's happening in Palestine and Kashmir um, as an excuse for you know, settler colonization, ongoing settler colonization in those spaces. And we can see it in many other places as it pushes stateless peoples into the margins and, you know, into essential work, um, but that, that's undervalued, but is, um, is, is there to support our economy um, out of sight. Um, so I think surveillance does that sort of work in many ways by making people potentially detainable. Um, and, and I think there's roots in, in the global war on terror in many cases. So that's a, a very short sort of sketch of what terror capitalism is. Um, when it comes to abolition, I mean, of course, I'm a, a prison abolitionist. Um, it, where the uptake in China is not really as at the level that I think anyone wishes it was um, who's interested in abolition. Um, many of the people who are coming to it from in, in the Chinese context are coming from sort of minoritized positions, you know, sexual minorities. Um, political minorities, uh, labor activists, um, and you know, folks in Hong Kong as well are, are certainly on the side of prison abolition. Um, but it's a quite nascent sort of movement. In China in general, prisons and police are seen as essential to, their, to people's security. Um, and most people you know, really don't have a critical view of it. Um, they feel like it's, it's something that's necessary to protect them and that people that go to prison deserve to be in prison. 
Um, so it's it's something where there's much more work to do, um, but something that I'm invested in. Yeah. Um, can I ask you what are what kinds of sort of cracks and fissures? I mean, this is an audience question that um, was also is also um, was initially asked for Helga, but I want to bring and I want to bring Helga in, and I want to ask you as well, sort of what kinds of cracks and fissures do you see that might open the space for um, for questioning and having you know and creating resistance around um, these surveillance practices? Is it an is it a total surround or what kind of potential, you know, uh, possibilities are there? Mm -hmm. How rigid uh, are the boundaries, realms of digital enclosure? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that happens when these systems are digital is that they're open to forms of surveillance, of reversal. Um, but I think it, at least in the Chinese case, it's mostly like people inside the industry or in the state apparatus that are wanting to leak information that's digital. And so I've been working with Intercept on 52 gigabytes of internal police documents that show how this policing was done at the grassroots level over two years. Um, and that's you know available to us because it's digital. Um, so you know leaking is is possible in, in a way that it wouldn't be otherwise. Um, so that's, I guess, one, one element. Uh, inside the space, you know, in sovereign space of the Chinese state, um, stepping out of the system is really difficult. So if you have a phone registered to your name, which is a, it's an ID card that, you know, has your face and biometrics associated with it, like, as you go through a checkpoint and you're asked for your phone, if you don't have it with you, that's a sign of suspicion, um, which will be recorded and then can, you know, over time result in you being you know, interrogated and whatnot. So you have to really perform a kind of political subjectivity um, and carry your phone. Mostly what I've seen people do is they just start to sort of repeat what the state you know, sort of narrative is, what people in the grassroots political positions in their neighborhoods are doing. Um, you know, so, so I think people have really begun to really change their digital behavior. Um, I did, you know, in my interviews, people talk about how they would go to a sauna or a park and not bring their phones. Um, and know that that was a safe space where they could speak more openly. But, you know, that's a pretty small sort of outside of the digital enclosure. So it's, it is a really difficult system to know how to, how, how to escape from, especially for those that are marked as Muslim and, uh, and you know, ethnically other. The Han people in that space, I think, have a lot more latitude. And that's really where we're seeing the leaks come from, is the, the Han people that, that want the world to know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on this, Helga? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I, I, I tried to write this piece a few years ago and it sounded completely insane, but the more that I've thought about it, the more it's like, no, it's actually, uh, it's not as insane as it seems, which is to revert back to pigeons as our mode of long distance communications, right? And I wrote this thing and it was like, you know, it was an actual um, plat, like an, an actual infrastructure of how would you get information in and out of Gaza that is not subject to surveillance or control or profit uh, by Israeli, uh, by the Israeli regime. And, you know, I tried to calculate like how many pigeons and how much can they fly and how much bandwidth can they carry? And of course, you know, given that a place like Gaza doesn't have electricity half the time, turns out that pigeon bandwidth is a hell of a lot faster than the internet connection that exists. So <laughs> partially as a joke, but partially, you know, I guess what I'm trying to get at is there are always ways sort of around, right? I think sometimes it helps to sort of revert back to like low technology, right? Or whatever you want to, might want to call something like pigeons, right? Uh, things like tunnels, things like kites, things, you know, so there's always ways around, right? But I think what's, what becomes clear in the cases of whether it's Gaza or in the case that Baron is talking about, and in certain ways, there's so many parallels. It's just, it's often seems like it's a, it's this question of scale, right? Like, you know, it's like Gaza, China, sort of similar, but multiplied by, you know, hundreds of millions, right? But what does seem, or what does also seem to happen is that the more, you know, I think of, like I think of something of like the Iron Dome, right? That kind of 
doesn't physically surround Gaza, but is on top of Gaza so that, you know, things can't fly in and out, right? Or very little of those can fly in and out. So it's also, there's, there's, there's always, you know, so no matter how much people try to sort of weave in between, there are always also responses that try to sort of encapsulate them or capture them or enclose them even more. And I, so I think it's a sort of constant back and forth. Thank you so much, uh, Darren and Helga. I want to bring in our final present our presenter today, Charlton McElwain. And so, um, Adrian, if you will start. Technologies of power. That's where I want to begin my brief remarks. Technology and power are linked in a number of different ways. We could speak of a causal relationship in which technologies, their design, production, or use generate power. We could speak of a linear positive relationship in which producing greater amounts of or more powerful types of te technologies in return produce greater amounts of power. We could also talk about the reciprocal relationship between technology and power, one in which the drive for power motivates the need for technology and technological production sustains that drive for power, or one in which the production of seemingly benign technologies inevitably get used in the service of producing, reproducing, and sustaining power. I say all that to say simply that I believe that power is, at least in my estimation, a necessary condition for thinking critically about any technology. That said, what I want to focus on today is something that lies in between technology and power, something that mediates the relationship between technology and power, something that we must interrogate if we are to truly understand the specific relationship between any particular technology and technological innovation and any particular accumulation of or exertion of power, particularly state power. And that is the problem. If we want to understand the motivations driving technological production, we must look at the problem a technology was meant to, or at least thought to solve. If we want to understand how it is that technology produces and reproduces power, we must understand how that problem is defined and framed. If we want to understand how technologies are designed, built, networked, and deployed in a way that they become technological infrastructure, infrastructures that undergird and sustain state power, we must look at how a particular problem and its framing perpetuate itself so as to produce technologies that systemically automate their so-called solution to this problem. I don't have much time, but I want to briefly demonstrate what I mean here by taking us back almost 60 years to tell a story about how today's state surveillance technological infrastructure began, or at least one beginning. It is a story about a specific technology, a so-called criminal justice information system named Alert 2 that debuted in Kansas City, Missouri around 1968. More than it's a story about technology, it's a story about a problem, one that existed, of course, long before 1968 and one that continues to persist on a global scale to this day, and that is race and the policing of blackness. This, the problem of blackness, of black people, of black threat to white power, I argue was and continues to be the fundamental problem that motivated and continues to motivate today's global surveillance state, the infrastructure of surveillance technologies that reproduce and sustain white supremacy. Before I lay out this very brief story, one that I chronicle in much more detail in my recent book, Black Software, I want to quickly identify what I call the seven dimensions of techno-racial infrastructures or what we might say are seven steps in the building of technological infrastructures, ones that not only reproduce and sustain power in general, 
but white racial power in particular. This process begins with first and number one, the identification of the problem. Second and number two, the institutionalization of the problem. Third and number three, the translation of the problem into a technological solution. Four, the application of the solution to the problem. Number five, the scaling of the so-called technological solution. Number six, reapplications in different forms of that solution. And seventh and finally, the ubiquity of the technological solution and the necessary ubiquity, of course, of the problem itself. At the dawn of the 20th century, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about the experience of being asked, how does it feel to be a problem? By the 1960s, that question had not changed, and Black folk were still the country's, that is the United States, most profound problem. We filled the streets of our largest cities and rural hamlets to fight for the right to be seen as fully human with equal access to opportunity. White America, however, called our tactics riots, civil disturbances, civil emergencies. To them and to the state, the problem, us, Black people were framed as a product of a backwards culture, one that produced almost inevitably a people bent towards violence, lawlessness, and criminality. The problem of blackness, the problem of black violence, the problem of crime, all of course one and the same in the mind of white America, was institutionalized, at least in one of many ways, in the formation of President Lyndon Johnson's 1965 Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice. This commission mobilized the power of the federal government to find solutions to the problem of crime, the problem of blackness and its threat to civil society. The commission's science and technology task force was specifically mobilized to find new technological solutions to the nation's so-called crime problem. Translating the problem into a technological solution began with an array of experiments that the Science and Technology Task Force embarked upon. Experiments that further located the jurisdiction for the problem of crime and its amelioration within the institution of law enforcement, and more specifically, policing. The embodiment of all these experiments came first, or revealed themselves first, in the form of Alert 2, again, a criminal justice information system that first debuted in Kansas City, Missouri, not so ironically, following the uprisings that upended the city in the aftermath of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in 1968. Alert 2 was a computer database network both locally, across neighboring states, and across the United States through the FBI's National Crime Information Center. It stored information about crime and so-called criminals, as well as routine police work. The system was so unique, so powerful and technologically innovative that it drew state admirers from as close as our North American neighbors in Canada, as far as Japan. Officials from which, and many other states uh, and countries, came to see and to witness this technological marvel in Kansas City this innovation in policing. In very simple terms, Alert, Alert 2 demonstrated and crystallized a racial and spatial logic for conceptualizing, operationalizing, and mobilizing police work. The application itself began not only to automate a new surveillance logic, but also generate new practices such as racial profiling that conjoined new technological systems with the racial problems they were created to solve. By 1972, there was at least one version of Alert 2 operating in every U.S. state and territory and proliferated by the hundreds throughout the 70s, 80s, and beyond, during which time there were many reproductions, uh, systems reproduced in countless and similar applications. As I state in Black Software, the problem with perpetually being a problem is that you become the object of anything and everything that holds itself out as a solution. Today's surveillance state is built on a technological infrastructure that is racialized and spatialized 
in such a way that there is a perpetual impulse and need to train and target surveillance tools on individuals and communities of color. Places and people that continue to embody not only the problem of violence and crime in the minds of white people globally, but every problem that the world views and the state views as a threat to maintaining an always existing perpetual racial order. Thank you for this uh, fantastic presentation. Um, you know, in our first event in September, we hosted Nick Estes, um, and Nick situated the global war on terror um, in the long, longer trajectory of Indian wars within American history. Um, and so our, our first question for you is, is, you know, how does exploring these domestic genealogies help us better grasp the circulation of security models and technologies at home and abroad and in multiple directions. A good example of this is the invention of the black identity extremist category, which seems to derive from these multi-directional circulations during the global war on terror. Um, can you tell us more about how you bring together these, these deep rooted genealogies and global entanglements? And how does bringing together these different scales of analysis help us understand how technology help constitute or structure a race, you know, as a as part of a race making uh, process. Um, thank you. Yeah, that that's a great question, um, and one that I could spend several hours trying to talk through and answer. Um, but I think the the starting point is a is a great one because I think it points out um, something that's important and certainly something that I've sort of jotted down and seeing tied through both um, Helga and Darren's presentation that. Um, given more time, would love to, to ask about. And that is, there's, there's a sense of, and my reason for thinking about both infrastructure and history is to sort of help to further illuminate and make transparent the ways in which these, um, this need for enclosure, the need for um, developing power in part by making sure certain others don't have access to power and everything that that entails um, persists. Uh, and so we see the same impulses that run through uh, our technological uh, uh, enterprises, no matter what that technology happens to be at the time. Um, and so when we're thinking of, uh, I think the questioner asked about um, Indian native uh, indigenous folks in the United States mm -hmm. and thinking about the way that the data technologies then help to disenfranchise um, and, and, and misappropriate, reappropriate uh, land from, uh, of course, uh, native peoples and the variety of ways in which that was accomplished and the ways in which that happened in sort of a dual way. Number one, that it um, absolved them in a, in a way of that land, but in doing so, created this sense of race or marginalization, however we want to call it. So those were mutually defining objects that the, um, uh, the, the racialization of space or the ways in which we configured, reconfigured, um, stole, misappropriated, reappropriated space was mm -hmm. a way of race making. And so for me, looking at that from that point on, on through uh, the 60s, and there's a, so much uh, in between that point um, and now, um, and thinking about some of Simone Brown's work um, uh, that takes us back through history and reconstruction and up through the 60s and beyond to talk about surveillance of, um, of Blackness in various ways, different technologies, same impulse, same motivation in terms of outcomes. So that, for me, is the kind of illuminating thread. And for me, it helps us to situate where and what the actual problem is, which is um, we typically go to sometimes the technology itself and think that if we make the technologies better, that they're um, uh, less part of uh, the system and so forth, that that's where our answer lies. Where I think um, where the real problem lies is us working our way through 
this persistent need to draw what W. E. Du Bois referred to as that color line. That is that, um, and I'm not meaning to be exclusive by sort of reducing it to black and white, but essentially a line that says there are those of us uh, that demand power and will maintain it and need to maintain it at the expense of all others and that becoming a prevailing um, way to uh, think about both policy, race making, state building. So I don't think that fully answered your question, but um, that's Thank about you. as much as I can get. Um, Charlton, I had a question, which was, uh, you know, in, in some ways what you're, uh, it, this is also much more in the book, but also in your presentation and the discussion, it seems that part of the construction of blackness within the United States as a problem is related to the outside of the US in the sense that Vietnam plays a role and the surveillance technologies there play a role and then you know uh, they circulate through black communities in the US. Um, the black identity extremist category that Adrian uh, just mentioned as well. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about kind of the way in which these databases, these, these categories kind of begin to circulate. So for instance, this category of extremist or terrorists with that, when the Capitol riots happened, there was sort of a push to say, these, these you know, um, white supremacists who are attacking the Capitol, that they are terrorists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then we start to, and this was seen as kind of, I think in some quarters as a progressive move to kind of deracialize the term ter terrorist. And I'm wondering kind of what you, think about that and the uses of that um, in, in the US context. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, I think I, it's interesting one for me as a kind of racial project or a racialization or deracialization project that is to uh, try to uncouple or at least problematize the associations between um, you know, terrorists and versions of uh, black brownness uh, and that coupled with uh, both racial and religious and uh, ethnic identities and so forth. Um, I mean, I think it's useful in as much as, you know, we know that there is a connection between the, the language, the categories that we use that get um, uh, structured and restructured into how it is that we define people and define certain types of political actions or positions vis-a-vis -vis, um, the state or, or other citizens. And so I think this is a, um, a helpful intervention, um, at least in theory. Um, you know, again, I, I tend to wear my pessimism hat most of the time about whether or not these things are ultimately effective because um, you know, let's face it, the, the infrastructure is there to perpetuate that continued racialization tied to the term terrorism or terrorist uh, and associated language in a way that is not there for undoing that um, in, in many ways. No, thank you. And I think uh, that this is a good place to transition to a, you know, an open conversation between all of our panelists and we'll go back to some of these themes. And, um, you know, our first question is really listening to these three talks. What, what came to us is, is uh, you know, the, the first thing that, that came to our mind was the intersection of these three supremacies that you, you've, you've been uh, outlining and their consequences. So we just talked about white supremacy right now in the, in the context of the United States and the construction of black communities and black persons as problems. Um, Helga began, uh, with uh, the the idea of a Jewish Jewish settler supremacy in Pal in Israel Palestine, and uh, and and Darren, we saw uh, some you know the construction of, of Han of Han supremacy uh, in China uh, since uh, two thousand since since the the early two thousands, uh, and so we'd like to ask you all to reflect on each other's presentation. Um, perhaps we can start with. Um, uh, Charlton, if you if you don't mind, um, you know how do you um, how do you see? Perhaps this is a direct follow up on Madiha's just question right now. How do you see that these global entanglements um, uh, factoring in the construction of blackness uh, in the United States? And 
for uh, uh, Helga and Darren, um, how does the, con you know, the concept of race and Charlton's framework might help you uh, make sense of your uh, respective uh, uh, terrains? Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. I, I don't know that I have an answer to your question because mm -hmm. all along to the presentation, I've been sort of dying to ask Helga and Darren this sort of question, which is particularly given the salience of um, you know, these themes around the, the carceral nature of these enclosures and technologies around race and ethnicity and space and place and so forth. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious to ask you all the degree to which you see race as a uh, sort of a, a through line uh, in all of this. Um, and in some ways to think about um, uh, sort of intention, which is where I often find my questions lie, which is, uh, you know, history being able to show some of the intentionality around why these things exist. And of course, as we move up to our present, uh, those things, those motives often being less transparent or uh, sort of uh, off onto um, euphemisms like security or safety or uh, what have you. Um, so I'm curious what you all think in terms of you know, can we think about race, ethnicity as a kind of a through line in this in terms of uh, political power, or is it in these different contexts really about sort of security or other things and race happens to be a byproduct, if you will, of that? Can I, ju can I jump in? Um, I, I know you have to go, Charlton, so I guess um, I hope we can continue the conversation, but um, I think you can approach it as race is something in common, right? Or sort of racialization is something in common. When you were talking, or when I was listening to you rather, or your um, your presentation, one thing that came to mind was, you, you know, the this notion of supremacy. And I just wrote down in my notes, like, well, is it really supremacy that is sought after? Or is it the suppression of any retribution of what has been done to those who've been uh, dispossessed or enslaved or killed or uh, siphoned off or, or, you know, whatever, like, you know, genocidal. I mean, the, the things that have been done to people all over the world is, is I don't know, uh, unspeakable, right? And, and it's like, of course, it's related. It's not to say that all these power dynamics are sort of separate. But so then it made me think that, well, there's something a little bit different in the Palestinian case, which is I think that the goal there is actually an erasure of Palestinians, right? Then I was thinking of Darren's, uh, Darren's um, example. And there I felt like that's, the purpose there is extraction, right? An extraction of labor, an extraction of capital, whatever. And then that sort of got me thinking about, there's also sort of differences. There's a lot of overlaps but there are also sort of really interesting differences in the micro techniques, if you want, right? Because one of the things that is formidable about the Israeli system is while on the one hand, it feels like it's completely enclosed, it's also about making life extremely unpredictable, right? So it's about technologies failing. They're not really failing because it's, the whole regime is about one of unpredictability and unknown for the Palestinian, right? So there's very, di so I felt like, well, there's sort of like slightly different kind of, uh, I don't know, through lines between the three examples. Yeah, this has been a really great conversation and I'm thinking in similar ways about connections and, and, and all of that. Um, so, you know, the, my framing of terror capitalism is, it's about surveillance capitalism, but I was also thinking a lot about racial capitalism and frontier making, which is what Cedric Robinson is really talking about, how frontiers are continually being made, that primitive accumulation is ongoing, um, and is always or often racialized, um, that difference is actually accentuated through capitalist expansion. Um, and I was thinking about the terrorist, the figure of the terrorist and Islamophobia as a new sequence in racialization or a new, new form of racialization. And then try to apply it to the Chinese case, which is complicated because Chinese folks are also racialized vis-a-vis -vis whiteness. Um, they have their own colonial history as a former colony, semi-colony of, of Western powers in Japan. Um, and so I think I've been thinking with a, a scholar named Natasha Kal, who's a Kashmiri uh, British scholar, political theorist, who's talking about the colonial wound and the moral wound of colonialism and how in India and I think in China, 
being a former colony is something that is propelling them towards colonization as a way of sort of achieving equality with other former colonizers. Um, so colon colonization is seen as sort of a good thing. Um, but at the same time, because of that racial history, they are also a racialized peoples in, in India and in, in, and in uh, China. So you know, I have to think about ethnicity and race together at the same time, um, and also think about you know, how what's happening in China is sort of a, a derivation of what's happening in other places. Um, but certainly, you know, it's on the skin, like they're reading people's faces, the phenotypes of their faces. And so there's no way not to talk about what's happening to the Uyghurs as not racial. Um, it's, it's, you know, just a new form of racism, um, something that's going, it's post-genomic, post-culturalist, and now it's digital, I guess, I don't know. Um, so we have to think about what racism means, I think, in, when it's digital um, and, and how it shapes it in different ways. Thank you so much, Charlton. I believe you have to go. And if you do, um, thank you so much for joining us. And being with us. thank um, you all. Thank you, for, thank you for joining us. Um, so we'll just go for another um, 10 minutes or so. But um, one of the sort of questions we had was, um, Darren, I wonder, you know, or rather Helga, I wonder to what extent um, Darren's kind of conceptualization of terror capitalism is useful in the context of, um, of, of Palestine. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm just making jokes today, but I don't mean them as jokes, right? So when Darren said, oh, it was like a month after 9-11 that, that the Uyghurs were called terrorists, I'm like, yay, Palestinians, we've been called that since the 60s, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so no, I mean, I think they're obviously sort of very related, right? And I, and I think it is interesting to think about when do these things kind of come into play and by whom and how, right? Uh, and so it's not just the Palestinians in the 60s, but it's also, I don't know, the Japanese Red Army, it's the communists, it's the Vietnamese. I mean, you know, it's all sorts of people that are called these uh, in, in various moments. So, so that was sort of on this sort of semantic, if you will, or, or sort of kind of discursive level. But I think that there's, there's a lot of parallels, of course, um, to this notion of, of kind of terror capitalism, right? But I guess there are times when I do wonder I guess there's there's times when I wonder whether scale is actually something really important to consider here, right? Mm -hmm. And so that I think you can call it something like terror capitalism when you're talking about something like the Chinese state, right? Because of the, the sort of massiveness of, of uh, the space, the capital, the profits, the, which is not to say that Israel can't or doesn't already, right? But for me, there's also something really interesting about what happens in these different sort of different scales and whether that's something that, that can be thought of as well. I mean, in a way, it seems like the scale is quite grand for Israel too. If we start to think about, you know, what you were talking about in terms of New York City subways and the, you know, that, that technology and also the checkpoint technology, which is now being deployed at malls uh, that you were talking about. So, um, yeah. Um, but I think we have some other questions, Adrian. Yes, absolutely. So now this is a public humanities initiative. And so we'd like to ask, you know, if you could share with us the aspect of your work that you wish to share with a broader audience, particularly younger members of the audience who've grown up within these assemblages of surveillance. I think all of us here maybe can remember a time when we didn't really have a smartphone. But I think it's not the case for a lot of you know, people who might listen to your talk. Um, and so how would you frame, given that sort of, you know, given talking to that, that, that kind of audience, how would you um, sort of um, you know, wish to sort of share your work and your main contributions? Like what's the sort of takeaway you would want mm -hmm. broader publics to take away from your work? Um, yeah, people who may not necessarily be in the weeds with us in terms of the academic angle, and particularly younger folks, as Adrian said, who've grown up with these technologies as kind of part of their life. Mm -hmm. the, the, is it significant that we all sort of remember a world with, before, sort of without these tools, 
And it, to what extent is this significant and, and does, should it shape the way we communicate about these topics? Um, does that make sense? Do you wanna go ahead, Darren? Or? Sure, I can, I can start, I suppose. Um, yeah, well, I mean, when I was starting this project, I was like the weaker migrants I was hanging out with, they love technology. Like it was something that made their world so much better. That's how they felt about it because it opened up so many opportunities for them. They could find jobs. Um, they could read the news. They knew what was going on, you know, in the Arab Spring. They thought that was exciting. They were like thinking about Palestinian solidarity as well, those sorts of things. Um, so they felt themselves becoming global citizens and that they are having opportunities presented for them, which I find in, in my classrooms, you know, some students are really excited about becoming an Instagram influencer, about building a digital persona, about the opportunities that the internet is providing to them, you know, self-publishing and all of that. Um, so the internet does do a lot of really good things. Um, it does help empower people. Um, it also, though, I think, you know, reproduces a lot of the existing systems that are in place in the world. Um, and what I really want students to think about is what what these technologies look like from the position of people that are vulnerable from, you know, if you're a stateless person, if you are a targeted minority by the state uh, or by these tech companies, that can actually really change your life in very negative ways rather than the positive ones. Um, because the digital enclosure is everywhere and we can't escape it, um, it means that all of our lives are, are affected by it, but some disproportionately more than others. Um, so, you know, I'd like people that are, are really coming to this conversation to think critically about who's protected by these technology systems and what kind of technology we want um, to be built in the world, um, who benefits from it, who has, who engineers and controls the technology, um, and, you know, think from that position. Okay. I guess I'll, I'll try to answer the, the question maybe in sort of three really quick ways. I think one in terms of like the intellectual perhaps takeaway that I would hope that people get is that um, there's no such thing as a virtual, right? That everything is also material and territorial or that these things sort of tend to work together, right? There's no such thing as a cloud and somehow disconnected from us. And, you know, um, so it's to sort of think about how different forms of control, different politics. It doesn't always have to just simply be about control, but different politics exist or politics exist at all of these different levels of life and, and, and all of these things that we engage in, whether they're technological or material or territorial or, or, or whatever, right? So that, that for me is a sort of takeaway. That, that's, that's kind of number one. Number two, I was thinking about it in terms of, um, I, I think your question is, obviously sort of really well framed vis-a-vis -vis public humanities, but I think it also kind of reflects back to, well, what does it even mean to do academic work in this day and age, right? And so part of that I, I understand is how do we translate our work into something that is more accessible if you want, right? Um, I don't yet know, right? I'm struggling to sort of figure it out. I, I'm trying to sort of write less and I don't know, do more visual stuff uh, you know, sort of more, more kind of techie stuff. I think there's an increasing sort of understanding within the sort of more traditional walls of academia that these things need to be done, right? So that's sort of, I guess, answer number two. And answer number three, I think it, it is in the space of the classroom in which we should encourage things like, all right, everybody, let's live tweet this lecture, right? Like, why not sort of meet halfway in between, right? Um, so I think it's just sort of being open as a, as a pedagogist, is that a word, as a teacher. Um, it's Friday, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, to, the business of We're all alive. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to sort of, you know, as a teacher to, I mean, A, you know, not feel like, oh my God, just because I don't know this doesn't mean I can't talk about it or I can't involve it, but to also just sort of be more open to these different sort of mediums, right? Mm -hmm. And then maybe the last thing I will say back to sort of Adrian's question is like, yeah, okay, sure. You know, we might remember the world before cell phones, but we don't remember the world before TV. Right. So, yeah. 
you know, or the world before radio or, poems. or, or right. So I think part of it is also kind of recognizing that, yeah, sure, there are new technologies, but there's also, uh, they're not always new in the way that we think about them. There's also mm -hmm. these continuations and the fears that we often have about technology or, you know, fears that people had about TV or about print. Mm -hmm. So. Well, uh, unless Darren, you'd like to uh, give us a last word, otherwise we'll just start closing down this. I'll just have a few things to say. Um, it, it kind of circling back to what Helga was saying about terror capitalism and, and before too. Um, so yeah, I know that there's a proliferation of capitalisms out there, um, you know, surveillance capitalism, disaster capitalism, et cetera, um, and you know, racial capitalism as well. But I think like, you know, racial capitalism is, is ongoing and, and is everywhere um, in, in so many different forms. And I think like, so for me, terror capitalism is something that it's like a specific frontier of capitalism as a general system, as a global social system. Um, and so it's happening in discrete places and it's gonna you know, express itself in different ways. I think it's more useful than calling it a security industrial complex, which you could also say it is, um, because I think it's producing something. It's producing certain kinds of workers, both uh, those that are you know, implementing the system. In, in my case, it's data police, which are these people that work on, they're called grid workers as well by the, by the state, people that work at the checkpoints. It's a whole army of them low level officers, often from the, the groups that are being targeted by them. Um, and so it's, you know, building these systems takes a lot of work, but then it's also producing certain kinds of subjects. Um, so that's really what I'm trying to get at, but yeah, it's not a perfect concept for sure. Um, and I'd really love to have more conversations about what these things look like in these different contexts. So, you know, this was a, a great panel for that. Well, thank you, and we hope that this will be just the beginning of a conversation. And, and um, you know, speaking about this, we had a question from the audience about where could we find your writings uh, available. And we are coming up with solutions for that. We're creating, um, you know, uh, like a list of recommended reading, readings that you mentioned in your talks or, or, or some of your own writings, and they will be up on our website uh, soon to answer the audience question. So we are actually uh, trying to thread these um, uh, you know, thread these presentations together, and we're excited about you know, you know, potential future conversations as well. So I'm just going to uh, leave it to Madiha to close our event today. Thank you to both our panelists or the three of our panelists. Thank you. Yes, I'd also like to thank our panelists today. This was a wonderful conversation, and I know I'll be thinking about this stuff for um, quite a while. I also want to, we also want to thank uh, several faculty members who've helped us with this, especially Manan Ahmed, Marwa Al Shakri, and Brinkley Masik, who've co organized this series with us. Um, just to let you know, um, Simone Brown will be here at the next panel that we have since um, Charlton mentioned her. Um, Technologies of Power has been made possible with the support of the Dean of Humanities at Columbia University, as well as the Center for the Study of Muslim Societies, the Departments of History and Anthropology, and the Middle East Institute. And of course, through the support of our current home institutions, uh, Arizona State University and the University of Toronto. Our website is technologiesofpower.org, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Tech of Power. So thank you so much for joining us today. Oh,